Hello, everyone on the call. Welcome. This is the Leaders for Global Operations web seminar series. I'm Josh Jacobs from the Program Office, and today we have Professor David Simke Levy, who is the faculty co director for the School of Engineering of the LGO program. He's a professor in both the Engineering Systems Division and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. Um, Professor Simke Levy is considered one of the premier thought leaders in supply chain management, as many of you know from taking his classes and interacting with them at MIT. Um, his research today focuses on developing, de developing and implementing robust and efficient techniques for logistics and manufacturing systems. He's published widely in professional journals on both practical and theoretical aspects of logistics and supply chain management. Uh, as many of you know, just last year, he brought out his new book, Operations Rules, Developing Customer Value Through Flexible Operations with MIT Press. And previously, he was the author of Designing and Managing the Supply Chain, The Logic of Logistics, and Managing the Supply Chain. He is a consultant and has collaborated extensively with private and public organizations and founded a company called Logic Tools that is now part of IBM, which provides software solutions and professional services for supply chain planning. Um, David, do you want to take questions along the way or hold them till the end? Um, at the end would be good. Okay. So, We'll hold questions until the end. You can use your chat function to let the host know that you have a question, um, and that'll be in the queue. And otherwise, we'll wait until the end to open it up. Thank you, David. Thanks, Josh. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, um, everybody, as appropriate. I'm going to uh, talk uh, today about operation rules, delivering customer values through flexible operations. This is the focus of uh, my new book, operations rules. Um, today, I will focus initially on uh, business and supply chain challenges, then introduce two important uh, concepts that um, have been the focus of my research and have been the focus of the recent book that I published a few, a few months ago. The first one is around supply chain flexibility. I will talk about what it means. Um, and then show and then shows how some of these concepts that I've developed in the last uh, few years have been used by different companies. In particular, I'll focus on Pepsi supply chain transformation. The second concept that I will focus on um, uh, is around supply chain segmentation. Um, talk about what it means and then uh, illustrate how a company like Dell uses this uh, approach to transform its supply chain and and its business. And its business. And finally, summarize with key takeaways. So let me start with today uh, business and supply chain challenges. I'm sure you're familiar with this. This includes the global supply chain with long lead time, rising and shifting customer expectations, suggesting that on the one hand, it's difficult to predict customer demand. On the other hand, there is a lot of pressure to increase service level. Significant increase in labor costs in developing countries. This is nicely illustrated with the following um, with the following table. What I'm doing here, I have looked, uh, I'm looking at uh, labor cost over a period of uh, five years in different countries. As you can see, uh, in China, over a period of about five years, labor costs increase year over year by about 20%. In Mexico, the annual increase in labor costs is by, um, on average, 5%. And in the U.S., the increase um, year over year is by about 3%. So if your company took production sourcing decisions maybe five, seven years ago, you may need to revisit some of these decisions. Not only uh, we have seen significant increase in labor costs in developing countries, but we have also seen significant change in logistics costs over the last few years. And this is uh, this observation is nicely uh, um, um, presented in the next uh, slide where I look at U.S. logistics costs as a percentage of the GDP over a period of about 25 years. As you can see, between uh, 1984 and 2003, U.S. logistics costs as a percentage of the GDP went continuously uh, uh, down. But between 2003 and 2008, it increased and increased significantly. And we understand where the increase is coming from. It's because of rising energy uh, prices. It is because of limited rail capacity in the U.S. suggesting not only that rail transportation cost goes up, but also implying that uh, 
that the, that that shippers uh, start uh, shifting from rail to the trucking industry. As a result, transportation costs in general uh, uh, goes up. Um, last year, in, uh, in fact, in 2009, we saw um, we saw U.S. logistics costs going down. And this is clearly motivated by the recent uh, by the recent recession. Not only we have seen significant increase in labor costs in developing countries and, and change and changes in logistics costs, but also risk has increased dramatically in the last few years. And I will argue that this is precisely because of successful implementation of strategies like clean, like outsourcing, and like offshoring. What does lean mean? Lean implies low level of inventory. Low level of inventory suggests that if there is a disruption, the supply chain will not be able to make supply with demand. Outsourcing and offshoring uh, imply that the supply chain is geographically more diverse, as a result uh, uh, exposed to all sorts of potential problems. The importance of sustainability has increased. And finally, probably the most important change in the last uh, few years, in the last two, three, four years, is a huge level of volatility. And here, I'm not only referring to volatility in demand. In fact, I'm more, I'm more referring to volatility in supply, in particular, volatility in commodity prices. This is nicely illustrated by looking at oil price. What I'm doing here, I collected data on oil price over a period of about 20-some uh, uh, years. For every year, I'm measuring um, the number of days the price of oil change up or down at least 5%. As you can see, in normal years, the number of days the price of oil change up or down at least 5% is 5 days, 10 days, no more than 15 days. But in 2008, the number of days the price of oil changed up or down at least 5% is in 39 days. And the last time we saw that level of volatility was in 1990. Ask yourself what happened um, in 1990. This is the first Gulf War. This is, in fact, the, uh, the previous recession faced by the U.S. If you are asking what happened um, just in the last two years between, uh, for example, the beginning of 2009 and the beginning of uh, 2011, the price of oil more than doubled. And this is not only about the price of oil. This is, in fact, about almost any uh, commodity. I looked at uh, the price of steel. I look at the price of different type or types of uh, iron. And, and you can see them here, huge volatility um, in, 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 in the price of different commodities. As, as a result, um, I, I typically summarize this section by saying um, today companies face uh, a, a new normal. Executive, in fact, in fact, face competition in an environment that is not only complex, but it's also uncertain chaotic and dynamically changing. And the question is, how can companies manage um, their supply chain under all these um, uh, conditions? Uh, I, uh, in my book, uh, Operations Rules, I argue that probably one of the most important strategies that companies can use to uh, uh, manage uncertainty, to manage complexity, to uh, uh, manage dynamic, dynamically changing environment is focusing on uh, supply chain flexibility. You talk to a lot of executives from different companies, they understand the need for flexibility, but if you ask them to define what exactly they mean by flexibility, um, you get very quickly a sense that this is not well, well understood. What is understood, though, is that flexibility does not come free. And so even if we are able to define what we mean by flexibility, the question is, how do we balance the need for flexibility with the need to uh, manage cost uh, effectively? And this is the objective of uh, this uh, discussion. And so let me start by defining what exactly I, uh, do I mean by uh, flexibility. Here is my definition. I define flexibility as the ability to respond to change. And change can come in many different ways, uh, demand volume and demand mix, commodity prices, labor costs, exchange rate. Whatever is important in your um, business, I want to include uh, in my definition. And of course, we would like to be able to respond to change without increasing response time. It's one thing if I can respond to change in two days. It's a different story if I can respond to change 
in, in two months. And not only uh, uh, do I want to be able to respond to change without increasing response time, I would like to be able to respond to change without increasing cost. I would like to uh, be able to respond to change while matching supply and demand effectively, in fact, by increasing service level. And I would like to be able to respond to change while improving capacity utilization. So as you can see, in my definition of flexibility, I focus on a number of KPI. I focus on response time, I focus on cost, I focus on service level, and I focus on capacity utilization. Of course, there are different ways to achieve flexibility. I classify them into three categories. Achieving flexibility through product design, process design, and system design. By product design, I mean strategies like uh, postponement, standardization, modular product architecture. These are strategies that have been used quite extensively in the high-tech uh, in high tech industry. By process design, I refer, in fact, to two different types of strategies. Flexible workforce and cost training, these are strategies that have been used in lean operations. And I also refer to flexible contract and dual sourcing uh, strategies. Today, uh, in the discussion on flexibility, I will uh, focus on achieving flexibility through system design. Um, by reconfiguring the manufacturing network, we will try to increase flexibility without significantly increasing cost in, um, in our supply chain. And, and this is nicely illustrated um, in the next slide where I start from uh, the benefits and the focus of um, um, uh, achieving flexibility through system design. Here, the objective is to control and reduce cost, and, and I include here manufacturing and transportation costs. The objective is to increase service level, and the objective is to utilize resources effectively. The key idea is quite simple, um, and it has been known for quite some time. On the left-hand side of this slide, you see what uh, I call a dedicated manufacturing strategy or a no-flexibility strategy. I have here five plants and five product families. Each plant is responsible for one uh, product family. Clearly here, there is no flexibility. Clearly here, the focus is on reducing uh, manufacturing cost. Why? Because lot sizes are large, there are very few setups, and so we reduce manufacturing cost, but this may come at the expense of transportation cost, and the reason is clear. On average, we are farther away from market demand, increasing transportation cost. By contrast, in full flexibility, each plant is capable of producing all product families. If each plant is capable of producing all product families, then we increase <coughs> manufacturing cost. Why? Because uh, lot sizes are small, there are lots of setups, and so we increase manufacturing cost, but the benefit is twofold. First, we reduce transportation cost uh, relative to the dedicated strategy because on average we are closer to market demand. Each market can be served from its closest plant. And second, of course, uh, we are in a much better position to make supply and demand under the full flexibility strategy. The problem with full flexibility is that it is very expensive to implement. And so companies typically are not interested in a full flexibility strategy. As a result, one may want to consider partial flexibility, for example, two flexibility, a strategy where each plant is capable of producing two product uh, families, or three flexibility, a strategy where each plant is capable of producing three uh, product uh, families. The, the amazing and surprising thing about partial flexibility is that if you design, for example, two flexibility carefully, you can achieve almost all the benefits of full flexibility without the investment required for full flexibility. And so I'll start by talking about how can one design uh, sparse or partial flexibility, what is the benefit, and then I'll take you through an implementation at Pepsi Bottling Group showing um, how, uh, what was the impact. And when I talk about Pepsi, this will no longer be a projection or estimate. This will be what Pepsi reported two years after the implementation of this strategy. And so let me start to understand uh, uh, some of the design issues and to, uh, to understand some of the benefits from partial flexibility. Let me start with uh, a case study. This is a manufacturer in the food and beverage industry. Uh, the company, when we started, had um, 
had a dedicated manufacturing strategy, five uh, plants and five product families. Each plant is responsible for one product uh, family. Capacity utilization was 90%. The remaining 10% are there so that uh, the company can match supply with demand when demand is different than the, the forecast. Realizing the increase in the level of volatility, especially in demand, the question the company asks is, what should we do? Well, uh, if you think, if you take a step back and you think, what can I do when the volatility, volatility, volatility increase? Uh, there are four strategies uh, to, to, to think about, three of which are relatively intuitive. As well, the level of volatility increase, one may uh, consider building buffer inventory. Well, um, the company was not interested in, in building inventory, both because of cost, but also because of freshness and, and life cycle of its product. The second potential strategy is investing in capacity. This can be very expensive. Again, uh, uh, this was rejected. The third potential strategy is to say, well, we cannot invest in um, inventory. We are not in interested in investing in capacities, but we can uh, focus on, on time as a buffer. Instead of responding within um, um, our current committed response time, we will increase it to maybe two weeks. Uh, of course, this puts the, the, the company in a situation where it's not going to be very competitive. And so if you cannot buffer with inventory, you cannot buffer with time, and you cannot buffer with capacity, the question is what can be done. This is where flexibility comes to mind, and the objective of this discussion was to identify how much flexibility the company needs, where to invest in flexibility, and what is the potential benefit of uh, flexibility. To give you a little bit more insight about the company, five plants, one in Pittsburgh, one in Dayton, one in uh, Texas, uh, Omaha, and, and California. The numbers on the right hand side represent uh, labor cost. You can see that from labor cost point of view, the facility in Dayton, Ohio is the least cost facility, and the facility in uh, California is the high cost facility. There are eight distribution centers in Baltimore, Chattanooga, Chicago, and so forth and so on. This project is not about uh, changing the distribution strategy. We are not going to open or close any, any distribution centers. This project is all about the, level, the degree of flexibility. The transportation strategy is uh, straightforward, in, uh, and it's really typical in the food and beverage industry. Inbound is inbound transportation from the plant to the distribution centers is done with full truck load and outbound from the distribution centers to the retail outlets is done with LTL and private fleet. Here you see uh, a little bit more insight about the distribution of customer demand. The dots represent different demand points. The size of each dot uh, is proportional to demand volume. Colors of different states uh, uh, indicate uh, population density. The stronger the color, the higher the density, and uh, so as you can see, and as you expect in the food and beverage industry, demand here is proportional to uh, population uh, density. Finally, um, a little bit more about the strategies that the company, uh, the manufacturing strategies that the company uh, uses. Uh, the color code in this slide suggests that the high volume product, which is product um, which is product five, is produced in the low cost facility in Dayton, Ohio. And the low volume product, which is product, um, the high volume product, which is product one, is produced in the low cost facility in Dayton, Ohio. And the low volume product, which is product five, is produced in the, in the high cost facility in California. So you can see that everything here in the current strategy is focused on reducing manufacturing costs. It's a dedicated manufacturing strategy, large lot sizes, very few setups. The assignment of product to the different facilities is done to reduce manufacturing costs, perhaps at the expense of transportation costs, certainly uh, with an impact on the ability to make supply with demand. And so we analyzed five different uh, strategies. The first is the baseline, don't change anything. Minimal flexibility or two flexibility, each plant is capable of producing up to two product families, average flexibility or three flexibility, all the way to full flexibility. 
Of course, as you increase the degree of flexibility, the initial investment required to reconfigure the network uh, increases. So if we need to invest in full flexibility, clearly this will require significant investment uh, from the company. And so let's start by uh, trying to get an insight into the impact of different uh, flexibility strategy on the different KPIs. And I will start with the impact on transportation costs. Uh, on the left-hand side, in this slide, you see the different distribution centers, Baltimore, Chattanooga, Chicago, and so forth and so on. At the top, you see the different flexibility strategy, baseline or dedicated to flexibility all the way to fu full flexibility. Bars represent, um, bars represent transportation cost. The longer the bar, the higher the transportation cost. And so, as you can see, when we start increasing the degree of flexibility, the bars become shorter and shorter suggesting that transportation cost decreases. And we understand why this is happening. For example, if you look at product five, product five in the baseline is shipped to the Baltimore facility from the plant in um, California, whereas in two flexibility, the Baltimore warehouse receives this product, product five from a facility from the plant in Oma, a much closer uh, uh, manufacturing facility. Of course, uh, as you increase uh, flexibility, while transportation cost goes down, uh, manufacturing cost increases. And this is nicely represented by this slide. On the X coordinate, you can see the different degrees of flexibility, baseline to flexibility, all the way to full flexibility. The orange line represent, uh, represents transportation cost. As we increase the degree of flexibility, we uh, decrease transportation cost. The line uh, at the center represent uh, the impact of flexibility on manufacturing cost. As we increase the level of uh, the degree of flexibility, manufacturing cost goes up. The top line represent total supply chain cost. I am not including here the initial investment required to, re required to reconfigure the network. This is basically the top line represents only annual operational cost, as you can see. Investing in full flexibility allows us to uh, reduce total supply chain cost by 13%. However, when you look at this line representing total supply chain cost, you see an important characteristic. It suggests decreasing marginal returns. In fact, investing only into uh, flexibility allows us to capture 80% of the benefit of full flexibility. And so when we show this to um, the executive in the company, they said, well, this is great, uh, but maybe we need a higher degree of flexibility, not uh, from cost point of view, but from the point of view of our ability to better match supply with demand. So to find out whether the company needs a higher degree of flexibility, we asked the company to provide us with different scenarios where demand may be different than the forecast. And they came back to us with a long list of scenarios. Here are three examples. In scenario one, demand for product one and two increase significantly relative to the forecast, and demand for the other product decrease. In scenario two, demand for product four and five increase significantly, and demand for the other product goes down, and so forth and so on. Of course, we cannot design the supply chain uh, um, for a specific scenario because we don't know which scenario will be realized. And so, in all the strategies that I'm talking about, the design of the supply chain is based on the forecast, and then I'm going to test the effectiveness of each design, which is based on the forecast, against all the different, uh, the different scenarios where demand is different than the forecast. And so uh, let's uh, start by testing the effectiveness of the baseline, and uh, for example, to flexibility, uh, all design, both are designed uh, based on the forecast against the three scenarios that I have here. And this is nicely illustrate, illustrated in slide 23, where on the left-hand side you see the three scenarios, scenario one, two, and three. Um, and I'm comparing, you can see in the second uh, column, um, the baseline in each case to uh, minimum flexibility or two flexibility. And, and as um, you notice, I'm focusing on the four KPIs. I am comparing the two designs uh, based on the amount of demand satisfied, based on the shortfall, how much of the demand I lose uh, 
because somehow I cannot satisfy this demand, the cost per unit and plant utilization. As you can see, scenario by scenario, the following is true. Let's start with, let's look at scenario one. Uh, two flexibility or minimum degree of flexibility satisfies a much higher degree of demand, much higher level of demand. The shortfall is huge under the baseline, meaning we lose about 1.5 million units of demand in the baseline, but the shortfall goes down to zero in two flexibility. In fact, if our objective is better to match supply with demand, uh, we really don't need more than two flexibility. Two flexibility achieves the maximum potential service level that this supply chain can achieve. Cost per unit goes down significantly and plant utilization uh, goes up. And this is true, in fact, for all the different scenarios. Now, when you look at scenario one or the other scenarios and you focus on the baseline, you see something um, a little bit uh, insightful. In the baseline, the shortfall is very high. We lose about 1.5 uh, million units of demand, but plant utilization is, is, is poor, is low. How is it possible that the shortfall is high, but plant, uh, plant utilization is low? So notice that total capacity in the baseline, dedicated strategy, and two flexibility is exactly the same. But in the dedicated strategy, in the baseline, I have the wrong capacity, and as a result, I lose many customers. So the question is, where is the power of, um, of two flexibility is coming from? This is nicely illustrated by the next slide, where I look at both the dedicated strategy and the two flexibility strategy. Different colors here represent different products. The X coordinate represents different plants. Um, the top design on the left hand side represents the dedicated manufacturing strategy where, as you can see, each plant receives one color, meaning each plant is responsible for one product family. The bottom design is a two flexibility strategy generated in the analysis. You can see that here each plant is responsible for two colors. For example, Pittsburgh is responsible for green and orange. Uh, Omaha is responsible for orange and purple and so forth and so on. When you look at this design, it's not clear why this design is so effective. But here is a different way to present this design. Um, in, on the right hand side, you can see the plants and the product. A link uh, connecting a plant to a product is an assignment of a product to this specific uh, plant. Um, you can see that the design on the right is exactly the same as the design on the left. For example, on the left, uh, um, in the two flexibility strategy on the left uh, uh, side, Pittsburgh is responsible for green and orange, and on the right, Pittsburgh is responsible for green and orange. On the left, OMA is responsible for purple and orange. On the right, OMA is responsible for purple and orange. But when you look at the right hand side, you see where the power of two flexibility is, com is coming from. The design here is focused on generating a domino effect. There is a long chain connecting all the plants to all the products. You can see the long chain connecting Pittsburgh to two, from two to Oma, Oma to five, five to Modesto, and so forth and so on. It is this domino effect that provides the power of two uh, flexibility. To convince you that indeed this is true, I want to compare two different designs. One where I generated this long chain that I have here, and the other one where I use another two flexibility strategy with multiple short chains. And this is presented in the next uh, slide, where you can see at the top the two uh, flexibility strategies that we just analyzed. Here it is. Um, you can see the long chain on the top right-hand side. At the bottom, you see um, on the left-hand side, you see another two flexibility strategy. Each plant receives two colors. Uh, but here, I generated two short, um, two short cycles. You can see the two short cycles. The first is the one connecting Pittsburgh Oma to three and two, and the second connecting Modesto Dayton Amarillo to five, one, and four. And as you can see, there is no connection between the, the cycle connecting Pittsburgh Oma three and two to the cycle connecting Modesto Dayton Amarillo five, one, and four. So let's try to understand intuitively where the power of the long chain is coming from. Suppose all the, product are, all, all the plants are working at capacity and somebody told you 
the demand for product three increased by one unit and demand for product one decreased by one unit. And in the design at the top, because of the long chain, uh, we can do the following. Since demand for product one decreased by one unit, we can decrease the amount of product one produced in Dayton, decrease the amount of product four produced in Dayton. Therefore, we can decrease the amount of product four produced in Amarillo and as a result, increase production in Amarillo for product three and satisfy the additional demand for product three. We can do that in the design uh, that uh, uh, at the top that connects all the products to all the plant, but we cannot do it uh, in the design at the bottom because there is no connection between um, between product three and product one. And this in intuition is quantified in the next table where I am uh, analyzing the, the three different scenarios. And for each scenario, I'm comparing the two flexibility with the long chain to the two flexibility with short chain. And you can see, for example, by looking at scenario two, the amount of demand satisfied with the long chain is significantly higher. The shortfall with the long chain is zero, but it's huge in the short chain. Cost per unit goes down and plant utilization goes significantly up. That's why I say that the long chain is typically preferred when you design your manufacturing network of flexibility. Let me show you how this concept was implemented at uh, Pepsi uh, Bottling uh, Group, Pepsi Bottling Group. Now it's called the Pepsi Beverage Company. Um, is, uh, is is today a business unit at Pepsi at PepsiCo. It's a 15 billion dollar uh, business unit. Um, in the U.S., PBG has more than 50 plants and about 300 distribution centers. Uh, for the purpose of managing the supply chain in the U.S., the company um, partitioned the country into seven business units. Each business unit is each business unit is has a number of plants, a number of distribution centers, and is responsible for demand in its own territory. It um, trucks log in every day more than 200,000 miles. And, and uh, there is a strong focus on customer service in this organization. They came to us at MIT uh, at the end of 2005, the beginning of 2006, with the following observation. They said, consumer preference is shifting from carbonated to non-carbonated drinks and from cans to bottles. Um, but they said these newly preferred products are produced in a limited number of plants. In fact, we have a dedicated manufacturing strategy, and as a result, huge service problems during periods of peak demand. The question is what to do. The first thing that they said, we are not interested in more capacity. We are not interested in more inventory. We certainly are not interested in increasing our committed response time. Uh, and we are not interested in changing the distribution network. Uh, is there anything else we can do? We basically suggested the flexibility strategy implemented it um, in using three steps. We started with uh, a central business unit that has uh, three plants and 22 uh, warehouses uh, just to build some intuition and to evaluate the effectiveness of our strategy. Uh, when this was successful, people said, yes, but this is really a very uh, small uh, business unit. Then it was implemented in another business unit with uh, 20 plants and 125 warehouses. Uh, after the success in the second step, um, at Pepsi, the, the business units are uh, fairly uh, independent. Each business unit can decide whether or not they are interested in implementing the strategy. So it's a decentralized organization. And so a total of five, uh, um, of five business units decided to uh, use the strategy. Two of the business units decided that they are not interested in this new strategy and they continue they continue with, with whatever uh, they have used uh, uh, up to that time. Pepsi measures the performance of the different business units for a period of about a year. And keep in mind, five were using the new strategy, two did not. And after 12 months, uh, the difference between the performance of the, of the five business units that used flexibility and the other two that did not was so 
great that uh, all business units decided to uh, participate. And so uh, two years after the implementation, Pepsi uh, uh, published a press release um, discussing the impact of flexibility on its, um, on its business. And in the next slide, what I'm do, uh, going to do is to quote um, just different statements from their press release. So the first thing that Pepsi said is that this sourcing flexibility strategy help us create our SNOP process that bring together supply chain, transportation, sales, manufacturing, to talk about pre-built strategies and, and, and manufacturing sourcing uh, uh, strategies. So that you look at this and you say there is nothing new about this. Lots of companies uh, have used uh, SNOP to better manage their supply chain. Second observation that they emphasize is that they, this helps them reduce raw material uh, cost by about six million. You look at this and you tell yourself this is nice, but there is nothing uh, impressive about these numbers. This is a $15 billion company, uh, business unit, so uh, reducing its cost by six million doesn't make a huge impact. The third um, observation in the press release was that the company was able uh, to observe a two percentage point uh, a decline in gross of transportation cost as revenue goes. That's very important because a large part of the total supply chain cost is transportation cost. And then at the end of the press release, the company said, forget about all these benefits, especially the impact on transportation cost, which is significant. Uh, here is the key impact of the flexibility strategy. It provided us, Pepsi said, with an additional 12 million cases available to be sold due to reduction in warehouse out of stock. If you ask, what does this mean? The press release said the following. This reduction in warehouse out of stock level effectively added one and a half production line worth of capacity to the firm supply chain without any uh, capital uh, investment. This is the power of flexibility. A small investment in flexibility can make a huge impact on supply chain performance. And so let me break here and see if we can have questions before we um, uh, continue to the second part. Um, discussing supply chain segmentation. And maybe if there are enough questions, then we will not talk about supply chain segmentations. Any questions? There are not any questions asked. So, uh, yeah, I have, I have one question. Uh, something you could talk a little bit more about the challenges uh, that Pepsi faced as they were um, as they were going through the pilot study, I imagine coordinating the actual production was among them, putting systems in place to determine which capacity was used for which production. I wonder if there, that was an issue or if you have any other lessons learned. So there are three lessons learned that, that we can focus on. The first is, I focused on, on long chain. There are lots of long chains that you can use. Which one is appropriate for my business? Right, and the one that's appropriate for uh, for one business unit may not be appropriate for the other business unit. This is where the geography plays a role. So, so taking into account transportation costs, and taking into account the distribution of customers in the specific territory, he told us exactly which which long chain is appropriate, which design is appropriate for individual for individual uh, uh, business unit. This also immediately tells you what is the second lesson learned, which is uh, you need a technology that allows you to optimize across the manufacturing network and across the distribution network in order to find out which, which um, long chain to implement. And the third lesson uh, learned is that because the environment is changing dynamically, this is not a single shot. You need to do this, and you can think about this as production sourcing strategy, on a quarterly basis. And so basically what uh, uh, Pepsi is doing is running these algorithms every quarter to identify how to assign product to the different plants. This also immediately tells you what should be the procurement strategy in the specific, in the specific quarter. So, this, so there, there are a couple of lessons there, and I, I focus more in my book of, on other issues. But I think this gives us an insight on the types of lessons that, that uh, Pepsi has used 
in the implementation of this type of strategies. Absolutely. I had one other quick question. What, what method did you use to do all of the analysis uh, involved in coming up with the, uh, with the numbers and the scenarios? So, um, as you will not be surprised, I use the software developed by my own company, which I, I don't own anymore. It's now part of IBM. But um, we have, uh, my company, Logic Tools, uh, used to have three software packages. Now IBM has them, one for production uh, planning and scheduling, one for, um, one for uh, inventory optimization, multi-echelon inventory optimization, and one for supply chain design. So the software that we used was the one for supply chain design. And, and what we needed it was to develop on top of the software a, an interface that connects the ERP system that Pepsi has to the technology so that on a quarterly basis you can basically run the analysis relatively quickly. This is not hitting a button and just looking at the result, but it, you don't need to build everything from scratch. Any other question? Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to use the raise your hand button located at the bottom of the participant screen or type them addressed to everyone in the chat window. So if there is no question, let, let me switch to supply chain segmentation and, and then take a couple of questions after that and, and we will be done. Okay. So. Um, the second concept that my uh, book has uh, focused on is, is supply chain segmentation. And here again, I want to talk about the key ideas and, and, and how Dell took advantage of some of this concept and, and show you what was the impact on Dell. And again, when I talk about Dell, much like when I talk about Pepsi, and I show the benefits, this will not be projections. This will not be estimates. This will be, in fact, what Dell reported. The, uh, uh, was the impact of um, of the implementation on its supply chain and on its business. And so my starting point is defining supply chain segmentation. I claim that um, supply chain segmentation depends on three important uh, dimensions. Uh, the customer value proposition, product characteristics, and channel to market. Depending on each one of them, you may need a completely different um, supply chain strategy. And in particular, when you focus on customer value proposition, when I focus on customer value proposition, I focus on the product innovation, how fast you change the technology in your business. I focus on production, on product selection and availability, on your pricing strategy, on what type of value-added services you focus on, and what is your objective in terms of customer experience. To illustrate the relationship between, uh, between uh, customer value proposition, product characteristic, and channel to market, let's take uh, a, a number of examples where I, I focus on companies we are all familiar with and, and identify the customer value proposition, for example, and the corresponding operation strategy. And so Zara, the most uh, successful uh, fashion retailer in the world, the customer value proposition is all about high fashion content at a reasonable price, not at a low price. As a result, the operation strategy is focused on speed to market. Walmart, as we all know, is all about everyday low pricing. As a result, the operation strategy is not about speed, but rather about cost efficiency. Amazon, uh, Walmart, probably most important competitor, is all about product selection and availability. As a result, the operation strategy is not about cost, but rather it's about reliable order fulfillment. Apple, we all know, is all about product innovation, and as a result, the company outsourced almost all manufacturing and logistics activities to other companies, and Apple sells as the umbrella organization that coordinate activities across the entire supply chain. Finally, uh, Dell Direct, this is the business model that Dell has used for many, many years. This is the model that if you open any textbook or paper on supply chain management, you will see a piece related to Dell Direct business model. The customer value proposition in Dell Direct is all about customer experience, and as a result, the operation strategy is all about responsiveness by focusing on a configure-to-order strategy. 
As soon as the company identifies a connection between operation strategy and uh, channel to market, customer value proposition, and product characteristic, the company will realize that there are a number of challenges that we need to address. The first is when you look, for example, at um, different product characteristics, you will see that some characteristics push you in the direction of one strategy, say a push strategy, and other characteristics pull you in the direction of another strategy, a pull strategy. The second challenge uh, that you will find is that for a lot of uh, companies, um, there are, uh, for instance, a number of channels. Uh, online and stores, each of which requires a different supply chain strategy. Uh, the same company may also serve individual consumers as well as corporate clients. Corporate clients require a completely different supply chain strategy than individual consumers. At the end of this process, you realize that you need multiple supply chain, and all of a sudden you increase the complexity of your business. And so uh, there is a need to make sure that while we match operation strategy with customer value proposition, with channels, with product characteristics, and we increase the number of supply chain in our business, we also focus on taking advantage of synergies across the different segments. Synergies that will allow us to reduce complexity and synergies that will allow us to benefit from economies of scale. And there are five areas where companies can take advantage of synergies. Synergies in procurement, synergies in product design, synergies in manufacturing, in logistics, and in order fulfillment. Uh, to illustrate the need for different types of uh, supply chain when you think about retail versus online, <coughs> let's look at um, Dell uh, business model, the direct business model, uh, where the focus is on online. And you realize that uh, this business, uh, this channel has unique characteristics. Um, online, Dell offer millions of configurations, so product variety is high. They customize the order for individual consumer. Because there are millions of configurations, forecast accuracy by configuration is poor, volume is low, and the cost of lost sale is high because online you focus on high margin. Retail is different. Retail is what HP has focused on. When you look at HP uh, uh, business model, the retail channel, HP offer um, just a number of configurations through Best Buy, and so product variety is low. Um, there is almost no customization in the retail channel. Forecast, forecast accuracy uh, by configuration is high because you, are, you have just a few configurations. Volume by configuration is high, and because in retail the focus is on, uh, on price competition, the cost of lost sale is typically Low, suggesting, therefore, that retail requires a different supply chain strategy than online. The same is true when you compare corporate to individual. When um, Dell sells to large corporation, the product is designed for the clients, forecast accuracy is high, the relationship between uh, Dell and corporation and corporations are tight. As a result, the supply chain strategy needed for corporate clients is completely different than the supply chain strategy needed for individual consumers. To illustrate the different types of supply chain, uh, let's compare retail to online. In retail, because of the characteristics that I described, it's all about efficiency, it's all about cost, therefore it's all about push. In online, the focus is not about efficiency, it's really about responsiveness, the need to better match supply with demand. As a result, uh, the focus is on time and therefore the focus is on pull. And this concept, pull and push, are not just academic concepts. They have important implications on the type of supply chain strategies that you need to run. In push, uh, this is the, we said is the focus of the retail ch uh, channel. It's all about cost. The product design strategy is focused on reducing uh, product cost. Uh, lead time are typically long because you select transportation mode to reduce, to reduce total supply chain cost. Pool is different. Pool is all about responsiveness. It's all about modular product architecture in order to better match supply with demand. Uh, pricing strategy, because of the service provided, is focused on high margins. And because of the need to focus on time, mode, transportation mode are short uh, because they are selected based on this objective. And so let's see how these concepts have been applied by, by Dell just in the last few years. A little bit back on, on the companies that you know very well, 
Uh, last year, um, revenue was about 53 billion. It, in, in the online space, it's considered one of the key leaders with 2 billion interactions annually. Um, they have customers in more than 150 uh, countries, and they ship, um, shows you something about the, the complexity of its logistic system, about one uh, system per second. In the last uh, few years, the company has faced a number of challenges. Consumer demand is shifting from desktop to notebook and handheld devices. Products become more uh, commodities. Because growth is now coming from developing countries, Dell has seen a shift from online to retail. And even uh, corporate clients are starting to shift from purchasing bulk PCs, just a large number of PCs, to buying complete, uh, complete solutions. And so when this project started, uh, about three and a half years ago, um, Dell executive identified uh, five objectives. You can see them here. The key one was that uh, we should focus on end-to-end -end supply chain transformation, that uh, um, Dell should simplify its product as much as possible, and, uh, and, and a focus on cost leadership and continuous improvement uh, were also identified as key objectives. Um, as you can see here, what the focus uh, is on. It's on basically uh, everything within its business, from product design to procurement to manufacturing, all the way to warranty, customer service, and technical support. Uh, because of the supply chain segmentation, um, the company, for the first time, has uh, four different supply chains. The configure to order, which is a pull strategy for the online business, the build to plan or a push strategy for the retail, uh, build to order for um, for corporate clients, and, and, and a, a new one, a unique one for um, online, build to stock, which is for the popular product where the company is pre-positioning popular products in its supply chain and responding very quickly to demand for this product in its online in its online channel. Of course, once you introduce a multiple supply chain, you need to take advantage of synergies um, in, in different areas. I will illustrate here how uh, Dell took advantage of synergies in the logistics network. And the way to do that is by, by using one infrastructure across the different supply chain. And so here is the Dell strategy in North America um, you can see that for online, uh, Dell ship by air to four locations, LA, Chicago, New York, and uh, Atlanta, and from there by parcel to customer location. In retail, um, because the focus is on cost, we ship by ocean to LA and from, them, uh, from there to Chicago, and from these two locations to, um, to retail outlets using truckload carriers uh, the build-to-stock strategy for the most popular product is a strategy where items are pre-positioned in LA and Nashville and, and from there to the clients. These items are shipped by ocean to reduce, to reduce cost. So you can see that even in online, there is a more sensitive strategy identifying the most popular, uh, the most popular product. If you combine all this, you can see that what we came up with, what Dell came up with, is, is a very simple logistic network to address a complex supply chain environment. One infrastructure across all its uh, uh, supply chain segments. And so what was the impact, you ask? This is from a summary by Dell. They said we were able to significantly reduce the number of configurations by 99%. So just think about these numbers. The number of configuration offered by Dell has decreased significantly, and this allowed Dell to significantly improve forecast accuracy. Uh, transportation costs went down by more than 30%, and manufacturing costs went down significantly by more than 30%. And so total impact on, on the business was, was uh, significant, both in terms of cost and also in terms of uh, forecast accuracy and responsiveness. And so let me summarize um, with a couple of observations. In terms of flexibility, I think it's fair to say that this is the age of, of flexibility. I present here a couple of 
uh, pieces of data on on what has happened in the last 30 years. And the same is true in terms of supply chain segmentation. I think it's fair to say that companies, uh, especially mid-sized and large-sized companies, need to focus on segmenting their business so that they match um, different supply, uh, different segments with the appropriate supply chain strategy. And I will stop here. Okay, thank you, David. Um, other questions? We're gonna, we have a few minutes for questions, so please raise your hand or you can unmute and chime in. In, I have uh, one question. In determining the optimum strategy for Dell, uh, what sort of analysis did you do? Is there a similar optimization involved? So, so interesting. The, the analysis here is, is not really that complex. You, you saw that what we have is a very simple logistic network, so you don't need really a large-scale optimization model. So I, I would say here it was more the segmentation and the strategy rather than an, an optimization technology. You were able to. Sort of intuitively simplify the network based on. Yeah, I would say it's more than intuitive. It, it, it's it's a, a fairly detailed analysis on cost and service rather than a large scale optimization model that uh, you do in a lot of situ other situations. All right, my, my suggestion is if anybody has uh, other questions when you look at the site again, just send me an email and I will. Uh, try to respond as fast as I can. Okay, thank you, David, and thanks to everyone who joined the call. Just a reminder that um, we do take the archived versions of these presentations with uh, the slides and all the discussion and mount them on the MIT Tech TV collection for LGO. If you just go to the MIT homepage and look at video, uh, look for Tech TV and search on LGO to find all our back videos. Um, this will be mounted there within the week, and I'll send out a reminder to everyone in our main distribution lists about that. Thanks again, David, and everyone on the call. Have a good day. Thank you.